Hi everyone, Seven Investing founder Simon Erickson here, and I am extremely honored and excited to welcome my guest this morning. Spencer Wells is a geneticist, he's an anthropologist, he's an author. Uh, he's got about 75 other titles too, but I prefer the one that's just really smart science dude. Spencer, it's really a pleasure to have you here on the program this morning. It's great to be with you, Simon. Good to talk to you. And Spencer, before we get started, we got a lot of exciting things to talk about. You know, we want to talk about genomics and kind of what the technology for that looks like, what the future of American healthcare looks like. But maybe let's start with a which a with a thank you for calling. And I know you're calling from the islands of Indonesia right now. I've been following your blog. Um, I know that you've traveled the world your entire life, but this just seems like a next chapter of your adventure. Can you start us off by telling us what what you're up to out there and how it's going? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a good question. Um, we were, my wife and I, um, who were living here, we were not just sitting at home in Austin, Texas, which was our home until a couple of months ago. Um, you know, I worked with National Geographic for over a decade and, and had this amazing opportunity as an explorer in residence, as they call it, to run travel, you know, options for National Geographic expeditions, which, you know, some of you probably get those brochures and see the beautifully illustrated pictures of polar bears and you're on a, you know, cruise and you see penguins and, you know, what I did, what I really specialized in was um, private jet expeditions. Um, because I think, you know, the work that I do as a geneticist studying ancient human migration patterns all over the world um, has that global reach. And so I designed and led nine of those for National Geographic um, between 2005 and 2015 when I left the society. And, you know, when I left, you know, the, listen, I can tell you, like, uh, going on one of those trips for the first couple of times is, is pretty cool. Like, it's, it's awesome. Like, you know, you've got 80 plus passengers and some crew packed into a 757. And so that equates to very nice leather, you know, upholstered business class seats. And you go to some amazing locations. But, you know, once you've done a couple of those, especially if you go to the same locations, they start to feel like very luxurious bus trips because you're dealing with a lot of people. I mean, like the logistics involved in the luggage alone I, I don't even want to bore your listeners with that, <laughs> but getting everybody's luggage from the plane to the right hotel room involves two staff members working full time, um, in addition to all the custom stuff that you have to go through. Anyway, so one of the things that I was wanted to do was to create a travel company that allowed us to do private jet trips, but on a more kind of regional scale with smaller jets. And so, you know, we've just finished our first jet trip in Indonesia using a G550, a Gulfstream 550, which is an awesome plane, by the way, um, that we chartered out of Singapore um, that was flown by the captain who flies the prime minister of Singapore on that very plane that we flew on. Um, and it was awesome. And, you know, we had a great time. And toward the end of that trip, you know, all of our guests who hail from the U.S., wanted to get back to the States. This was around March 16th, 17th, um, when things were really starting to look grim. And so we got them out on Emirates via Dubai, and they all made it back happy and healthy and had a great time. And, you know, we, you know, thankfully have customers for life as a result. But my wife and I were like, you know, when we came through LAX on February 27th, and we now know that the virus was circulating all over America, you know, by late February. Um, there were guys coughing into their hands and taking our passports and, you know, searching our luggage and, you know, everybody's crammed in with no masks on and, and we're like, we're not going back to that. And so the two options were, you know, my initial choice would have been Singapore because Singapore, you know, seemed to be doing the best job when we first landed in Southeast Asia, you know, beginning in March. But it was, you know, the, the, the dormitory cases were picking up at that point 
And, you know, it didn't look like the best option. In addition to the fact that we didn't want to go into a 14 day like lockdown in an expensive hotel room in Singapore. And I said, listen, we've got this credit at this, you know, really nice Aman hotel, the Amanwana on Moyo Island, a remote Indonesian island, where we can't get a refund for the guests and we're either going to lose the money or we can use the credit. And so we, we went there and, you know, it's, it's been fantastic. I mean, we spent two and a half weeks there and have since moved to Lombok where we are now. And so, you know, literally I can look across through our kitchen window and see the island of Bali. Like it's this ancient biogeographical barrier called Wallace's line that divides the fauna of Australia on the east and, you know, Asia on the west. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's been great and we're growing vegetables in our garden and we have, you know, we've adopted a kitten that was, you know, it was a stray that wandered in. We've adopted a puppy that was a, you know, stray village dog and gotten them all their shots and dewormed them. And, you know, we're building a, a life here. It's, it's fantastic. I love that story. Um, I also love the title Explorer in Residence, which to me sounds kind of like an oxymoron. You're all over the world. I guess that's the residence for you. Uh, another right. title you have is Entrepreneur, Spencer. You know, you're also the founder and CEO of Insightum, uh, which your, your company's mission is to uncover the genetic story written into our DNA. This is a direct to consumer opportunity for genetics. Can you tell us a little bit about what this company is and, and also what your goals really are for it. Yeah, so it's, it's very interesting that you're asking me this question right now. Um, we, we have wound down the for-profit company, the Delaware C Corp, um, which was funded by Warburg Pincus um, in a very complex deal because, you know, they're a big PE firm and they don't, typically fund small startups, but I won't go into the details of that. Anyway, um, the consumer genomics industry went through a massive shift last year, um, in part because people became much more concerned about privacy. Um, coming out of the Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, you know, social media scandal. And in part because I think we, we hit the peak of early adopters. You know, people who were primarily interested in ancestry, and this is something we encountered when we were trying to raise our, our Series B. Um, you know, we talked to a lot of VCs and, and they said, you know, so do you think the growth rate can go on like it has? I mean, my God, in 2018 and 2019, um, sorry, 2017 and 2018. God, it's, it's been that long. It just, the time is going so quickly these days. 2017 and 2018, the two highest selling products on Amazon outside of Amazon Alexa and, you know, their own Kindle devices and so on, which they're like pushing constantly. But like the two highest selling products were 23andMe and Ancestry, you know, Ancestry in, in 2018 alone sold 4 million units during Black Friday to Cyber Monday. That's unheard of. When I founded this industry in 2005, when we started selling genographic kits, that was two years before 23andMe, I thought, you know, if we hit 10,000 a year, we'd be lucky. You know, the, the CEO of National Geographic, who had formerly been the CEO of Time Life, said, if you sell a thousand, you'll be lucky. To sell four million over four days during a holiday season, I mean, that's, that's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And so I think, like, that kind of plateaued out. And then there was this, like, follow-on from, you know, okay, if, if these services are so cheap, you know, if, if you're on Facebook and it's free, if you're on Twitter and it's free, how are they paying for things? And, you know, the answer is always, you are the product. 
you know, your data is the product. And so like, I think a lot of people started to put two and two together, you know, beginning of 2019. And they were like, okay, so our genetic data is the product. And, you know, so sales have dropped off significantly. And so, you know, we, I made the decision last February, February of 2019, kind of seeing this coming, seeing the things that were playing out um, to convert us to a 501c3. And that's what we did last year. I couldn't imagine how long it would take trying to do it now with what the IRS is going to be dealing with, you know, over the next two years with late tax returns and, you know, unpaid taxes. But thankfully, we were granted 501c3 status last fall. And we have, you know, we have an institute that has contracts with companies and nonprofit organizations and schools, um, you know, in cytominstitute.org. Um, you know, so that's our way forward through all of this, you know. So in Cytom is a for-profit, Delaware C Corp is gone. You know, it's, it's no longer in existence. It's not doing business anymore. I, I first met you, Spencer, at South by Southwest in Austin in 2017. And I remember talking about genomics going mainstream. And just like you said, 23andMe and Ancestry.com were selling like crazy. And it seems the use case for those were information, right? People wanted to know their heritage. People wanted to know more informational, maybe even entertainment kind of, kind of reason. But now we've also seen that a lot of those genes are predictive of disorders, right? Of genetic disorders. Uh, several of them are medically actionable now, if you can actually see things like, you know, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, stuff like this. Do you believe that there is an opportunity for consumers to play a more active role in their health, where they're actually buying these kits, not for information purposes to see their ancestry, but something they bring into the doctor uh, and say, hey, I've identified something from this report. Let's talk about it more proactively. Yeah, I mean, listen, what we're seeing right now is the very earliest stage of a total disruption in healthcare, um, which needs to come. Consumers need to have more control over their healthcare. Um, and, you know, what, what I see happening, so the, it's, it's interesting, like COVID, this whole pandemic that's playing out, plays a role in all of this um, because it's kind of a test case. Um, what cities are finding out is they can monitor outbreaks of the coronavirus by looking at sewage. Interesting. And they can, they can see outbreaks before people start presenting with symptoms, okay? That is something similar to like Google tracking people, you know, looking for flu symptoms online. Like individual led healthcare is the future. Like this is what we've been talking about in the genomics community for 30 years, for my entire adult career in, in, in the industry. And, um, you know, but I don't think it's going to come from fitness trackers that you wear on your wrist. And I don't think it's going to come from, you know, blood tests that you do at a Theranos facility at Walgreens, obviously, um, or one that you choose to go into your doctor to get. I think what it's going to come from is your toilet every morning. Honestly, I, I, I think that, you know, you stick the right detectors in your toilet bowl and, you know, you have a little box that's on the sink next to that. And it's got a green light and a yellow light and a red light. And, you know, green light means it's another good day and you're fine. And yellow light means, you know, you should probably figure this out and check the app on your phone and see what's yellow. And red light means we are calling the doctor right now and you're going in for an appointment. Um, that's what I consider to be the future of healthcare in the developed world. You know, it's like you don't even have to think about it. And, and do, I mean, we've got Color Guard, right? Exact Sciences has got a 
diagnostic, a consumer diagnostic test for colorectal cancer already, mm -hmm. it seems like that's predictive of more of these appearing in the future where you're not going in, showing symptoms to a doctor um, mm -hmm. and getting reimbursed for a, for a visit off of an insurance, you know, physician fee schedule or something that we've gotten used to in the system today, but pro, more proactively having a consumer-based diagnostic like you're describing. Um, you, you, you just need the right, it, it's just like EHRs, electronic health records. Everything is so fragmented right now in the US. If you just had one company that came up with the end all be all solution, the Google Maps, of how you would monitor this. Like, does anybody use anything other than Google Maps? Like maybe some diehards use the maps on the Apple phone, but you know, literally like 99% of the world uses Google Maps. And that's because it's freaking awesome, man. Like there is <laughs> nothing that's ever been like that. Like I had been wishing for something like that all the trips I've been on over the years since I was like 20 years old and like now it exists. And so, you know, I use it all the time. You need a company to come along and be the Google maps for that sort of like home diagnostic space. You, you need somebody to like figure out what is the killer app? Like what is that green light, yellow light, red light box that monitors everything? whether it's occult fecal blood for colon cancer, you know, you mentioned the, the colon cancer test, whether it is, you know, shed cancer cells for a potential early cancer diagnosis, whether it's STDs, I mean, all of that could be figured out with the, you know, allow me to, you know, be a little bit out of bounds, like the dump you take in your toilet every morning when you wake up. Honestly, it's really that simple. And people would be so much healthier if somebody figured that out. And we have the technology. It's super simple. Like it really is. Like, you know, you just mentioned Cologuard. Like we know how to do this stuff, but nobody's putting together that end-to-end -end solution. And the company that figures that out is gonna make a trillion dollars. <laughs> and we've seen tech companies be very interested in this, right? Google's trying to get closer and closer to the EHR and the patient mm -hmm. medical data so they can actually start using that for, um, you know, machine learning and all the connecting all the dots between those. I mean, we're starting to see it. We're seeing a lot of hesitation, of course. You know, there's this one force that's very innovative of what the technology can do. And then there's also a lot of stop signs, you know, of people saying no privacy concerns, um, ethical concerns, things like this. Uh, Spencer, maybe my next question for you is about that, that ethical debate, right? I mean, we've seen, I guess CRISPR for the most part is in phase one of clinical trials now. Heavily regulated, heavily ethical debate here in the United States. And yet over in China, you've got Hei Jiankui Hei saying, an email, baby's born. We've gene edited babies. It's, you know, Pandora's box has been opened. Yep. Do you think that the progress of gene editing is regional? based on regulations and different, different societal beliefs on ethics of gene it's, editing? It's not just gene editing. Listen, um, China has won in the biotech space. Um, it, it won over a decade ago. I, I had a wonderful lunch with a senior Illumina executive, and Illumina is the company that you know, builds the technology that deciphers genomes and, you know, if you've ever done a 23andMe or an ancestry test or been sequenced by your doctor or anything else, like it's, it's been done on an aluminum machine. They effectively have a monopoly. Um, over a decade ago, I had a wonderful lunch at Torrey Pines in La Jolla, California, um, which is a beautiful golf course. And they have a wonderful restaurant and bar and we have great burgers and a good conversation and a couple of glasses of Sauvignon Blanc. And what this, you know, Illumina executive told me was um, he had been the one who had negotiated the deal between Illumina and BGI, which is now the world's largest DNA sequencing facility, currently located in Shenzhen. It was originally founded as the Beijing 
um, Genomics Institute, but it's, you know, it's a Chinese powerhouse in genome sequencing. And what he told me was he was so alarmed at the number of sequencers that they were ordering, even though, you know, it meant a huge bonus for him and the company's bottom line would be, you know, much better off, that he actually flew to Washington and explained to the National Institutes of Health and other members of the U.S. government that what China was doing was basically investing in winning the biotechnology race and that if we didn't do something similar, we would lose. And the U.S. government told him they didn't care. And he said, Spencer, it was one of the saddest days of my life. Um, you know, I, I believe in Western democracy. I believe in liberalism. I believe in all of the, you know, things that America and, you know, other Western countries seek to uphold. But China has invested so much in this that, like, you can never come back from that. Like, you know, they've been the biggest sequencing facility in the world for years. They've done the same thing with CRISPR. And they've done the same thing with genetic testing um, for, you know, traits, IQ. They have schools where they, they track children according to genetic variants, you know, that predispose to certain IQs. They've done that with sports academies. Um, America, you know, America has been hung up on other things for the last decade. Um, you know, I'm a big critic of the so-called social justice warriors online. Not because I, I you know, am an alt-right person at all. I'm, I'm a centrist, you know, fairly liberal, you know, libertarian person. But I think America has started, you know, biting its own tail and focusing on things that honestly don't matter to the future of the country. And in the process of that, we have created a system where a country like China that is very focused on the technologies of the future, whatever they might be, and China's, you know, and this is not my field, but I, I know that it's been happening. China is also very focused on AI. Um, so biotechnology and AI, big technologies in the future. China's way ahead of the U.S., in part because the U.S. has been focused on, you know, bullshit, in my opinion. Pardon my French, but, you know, it, I, I don't know what has happened in America. I don't know how we lost sight of the end goal. And I don't know why we gave, like, willingly gave up leadership in all of these industries. Like, we invented AI. We invented biotechnology. And we've literally just given up leadership to the Chinese. And it's not because I hate the Chinese. I, didn't, you know, the, I have issues with the Chinese, you know, leadership in the way that lots of other people do. But, you know, for the U.S. to just literally, like, to have a, a, a company like Illumina go to them and say, do you know what you're doing? And for them to say, we don't care. That, I mean, it just, it makes me want to cry. Like, as, as a geneticist, I mean, this is my field. It's like, oh my God, you literally did that? So, yeah, that's kind of my take on the whole thing. Well, Spencer, don't start crying on me because I know that you personally <laughs> gave the thumbs up to Illumina uh, and Cytome is working with Helix, right? Which uses Illumina's we next were, generation we, Yeah, we, we were. So, so Helix, Helix pivoted, you know, very sharply last year. Um, and so they're mostly doing population health studies. And this was part of the reason that, you know, we decided to, to become a, a nonprofit because, you know, what we do is storytelling. We have a podcast, the insight, you know, we have blog posts and we will have, you know, white papers coming out, genomic privacy policy documents, et cetera, we've been working on for the last several months. Um, you know, it just makes more sense to turn the company into a 501c3, which is, you know, what we've done. Um, and thankfully, that was completed before the whole, you know, economic crisis that's happening right now. But, um, yeah, so we're a nonprofit. Um, you know, Helix was an interesting potential business model. I think they launched a year too late. 
and you know we can talk about timing in entrepreneurial ventures um, sometimes a year makes a big difference and it turns out that the consumer genomic space is highly seasonal or it was it's not anymore but you know most of the kits tended to be bought you know the dna testing kits tended to be bought between september and january of every year and they were given as gifts christmas yeah yeah, it's the reason why, you know, I mentioned the ancestry numbers, like 4 million over four days. Like, that's crazy. Um, those, are, those were gift purchases. Um, you know, that, that has shifted, and I don't think a lot of people are going to be given gifts like that. A lot of those gifts were given to older people who didn't understand how their data was going to be used. And so, um, you know, that, that was already starting to shift around the time that Helix got itself off the ground and then i think there were some misfires on the products they chose to feature when they launched some of the lifestyle products like can you really tailor your taste in wine to your dna um not in my opinion but some people thought it was possible um why not just taste it you know anyway um <laughs> There, there were some misfires on the marketing front, in my opinion. But in any case, like Helix backed off of the consumer space and they're now focused on, they're essentially a CRO, a contract research organization. So they partner with big HMOs and, you know, healthcare companies, hospital organizations to do genetic testing on 10,000, 30,000, 50,000 people. Um, they've got an awesome lab. Their lab team is fantastic. They're literally the best lab I've ever worked with in the consumer genomics space. But the leadership at the top has been somewhat less than visionary. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Can you follow up on the technology? Okay, so first of all, the marketing is definitely an interesting slant because I remember seeing the, uh, the DNA artwork you could have behind your couch. Based, It seemed like everything was over the top uh, based on your DNA. Can you talk about the technology though? Because it does seem like Illumina, we're big fans of Illumina at 7investing. It seems like they've got more than 90% of the high throughput genomic sequencing that's being done in the world. You and I have talked before about opportunities for nanopores or for smart sequencing, which is longer read sequencing. Pacific Bioscience is a company doing that. Do you think that Illumina's short read next genomic or next generation sequencing continues to hold the stranglehold that it has on the industry right now no no i mean listen i i think illumina anybody who works in the genomic space knows where illumina works best and it works best when you have an existing scaffold to assemble the sequences on um and short reads do a really good job of that even though you know there are long long pieces of the genome that were left out until recently and that's part of the reason Illumina acquired PacBio. Um, but no, I mean, I, I feel like the future is with companies like Oxford. You know, Oxford Nanopore is, you know, that's, that's the kind of revolutionary technology that comes along once in a generation. And I have described it to people like, it's so funny, like explaining the actual technology of DNA sequencing to people who do, do not have a scientific background is so hard. Like, you know, the, the Illumina technology is, like I have to show them a video before they really get it. Like the paired in sequencing. But- I have a scientific background and I think it's hard, Spencer. Even if you have a technical <laughs> background, it's hard to understand what's going on. But, but people get the, the Oxford Nanopore technology if you simply say, think about those little plastic blocks that you used to assemble as a kid with different shapes and you would plug them into each other and one would be square and one would be diamond shape and one would be round and I'm like, imagine pulling one of those through your fingers and you can literally feel the shape of it. And they're like, oh yeah, that, that makes total sense. And I'm like, that's what Oxford Nanopore is all about. And if they can get the error rate down or they can you know, parallelize it enough, 
so that the error rate doesn't matter. And it doesn't for like, you know, HLA typing, for viral genome testing, like, you know, they should own the COVID space, in my opinion. I, I don't know why they don't at the moment, but, you know, maybe they're working on something. But, you know, rapid, cheap, prep-free DNA sequencing, like Oxford Nanopore, like, that's the future. Like, that's, that, that's what leads to at-home testing. Like, imagine that. Like, you've got a freaking machine you can plug into the USB port on your computer or into your iPhone, because they have a version that does that as well. And you can literally just, like, place a drop of saliva or blood, and you can test yourself for anything. That's cool. That's the future. It's not labs with, you know, $500,000 machines. And I love Illumina. I think, like, okay, Illumina, Illumina is not a great company scientifically, honestly. They acquired their technology. They didn't invent it in-house. They improved it, and they, they've done some great engineering tweaks. There are a bunch of engineers and marketers and, you know, accountants that have done a great job of kind of, like, building a business but they acquired Selexa technology and they acquired the, the, you know, the chip technology that dominates the consumer market now. Um, Oxford Nanopore, like it, they invented that. Like they're really smart. And, and I feel like if they had, if they were acquired by the right pharma company or large, you know, bio, you know, reagents company, whether it's Biorad or Thermo or somebody like that, you know, if they were acquired by the right company and they have the right marketing and the right budget behind them to develop this technology further, they could win the race. They could come out of nowhere. They would be like that horse in, you know, the, the last corner of the Kentucky Derby. Like they're coming around that, that curve and it just, boom. They, they go in for the kill because it's ultimately like Illumina makes its money from its reagents. It's the razor model. Um, you know, they, they sell machines at cost, but they, they make it up, you know, on the side in all of these reagents they sell you. And that's the reason people have learned to like cut them in half and like take all of these, you know, little, little, you know, shortcuts to, to try and reduce the costs. But, you know, that's ultimately their business model is selling reagents. Um, you know, but if you have a company that doesn't require reagents to sequence DNA, man, that's, that's the future. <laughs> I mean, that's where costs go to zero. That's where the cost of a genome isn't just $100. It's like a dollar. Which unlocks everything, right? Now that the yeah. cost is affordable for anybody to, to do it for whatever they need yeah. it to be. Yeah. Uh, sounds like those handshakes and the M&A discussions are about to get really interesting. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned the drug makers, pharmaceutical companies, and we had a really good question. I, I reached out on Twitter for, for people to ask you questions. One of the, my favorites was from Robert Carter who says, you know, we're, he's talk, we're talking about kind of the shift to personalized drugs, right? We've seen some of the drug makers like Roche uh, doing, uh, spending a lot of money on the diagnostics so they can understand what kind of drugs they need to make, especially for oncology and uh, really serious conditions. Robert on Twitter, Robert Carter on Twitter asks, will we see the pharmaceutical field change from mass producing medications to designing them more for the specific individual? I mean, Spencer, it costs an average over a billion dollars in 10 years to create drugs right now. Is this changing? No. No, I mean, I mean, listen, you, you know, sorry, we've got... I hear the kitten. <laughs> the kitten has an opinion on this got, one. We've got um, Sheba, the cat, that has decided <laughs> to come and appear on camera. Um, no, I mean, listen, personalized medicine is a misnomer. Um, drug companies don't want personalized medicine. I mean, as you just said, like, the economics don't make sense. You know, what, what drug companies want is a, you know, hit drug. They, they, they want, you know, a cholesterol treatment that, you know, 90% of Americans will be able to use. Um, they want, you know, potentially, although I think this will shift post-COVID, 
but potentially a, you know, CAR T cancer therapy that, you know, they can charge $3.5 million for. Um, I think that amount of money will drop significantly post COVID, but no, I mean, they, they want risk pools. They want people, there's a simple calculus that you do in one of these companies where it's like, okay, so let's imagine two potential areas of research we could pursue. Um, one is type two diabetes. And we know that type two diabetes is 95% environment. You know, lose weight, exercise, eat fewer, you know, high glycemic index starches, and you're probably not going to get it. Like if you have a low BMI and you're healthy and exercise and you're not eating a lot of pasta and rice and potato chips, you know, you're probably going to be okay. I mean, people have throughout history, type two diabetes is a really new thing as an epidemic. But um, let's imagine developing a drug for that in a place like the United States where, you know, type two diabetes is a massive raging epidemic, you know, particularly in minority communities, but, you know, in, in you know, white Anglo-Saxon, you know, American communities as well. And then imagine, could we devote those same resources to developing a cure for malaria in the third world? And so what's the ROI on that? You're not going to develop malaria treatments. You're going to develop, you know, marginally effective type 2 diabetes drugs. Um, and metformin has been around, you know, since before I was born. That's still the best treatment. There's nothing that's been developed that's any better than that, as far as I know. There may be some experimental stuff, but in terms of what you can get going to see your doctor, metformin is still the best possible thing you could take if you think you might get type 2 diabetes or if you have it. You know, and that's not a lot of, you know, success on the R&D side. You know, so we have a known threat that kills millions of people throughout the world, malaria, and drug companies turn their backs on it because they're focusing on a market where they can make, you know, a lot more money. And, you know, pharmaceutical companies in America pump up prices all the time. I mean, I, I read stat online, you probably do as well. And they talk regularly about the readjustment of prices and, you know, what should the price increases be? And it's arbitrary. It's like, you know, how much, how much do we want to pay ourselves in bonuses this year as part of the C-suite? You know, do we want to make 10 million or do we want to make 17 million or do we want to like buy a private jet and make 70 million this year? Like that's literally what it comes down to. And it's, it's a horrendous industry as a result. It's, it's in my opinion, the most corrupt industry in America like it makes petroleum companies look like nonprofits. Spencer, let's talk about the developing world because you've seen a lot of it <laughs> as explorer in residence in the plains across this this world that we live in with National Geographic there. You were you were tracking the migrations of people, right? Trying to kind of connect the dots of, of people's heritage. Uh, for several years, can you tell us about some of the, the higher level takeaways? It's a fascinating study. What, what did you learn from it? Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously, you know, piece together the details of how our species left Africa, which is ultimately our homeland. For most of us, for most of our genome, um, the story's gotten very complicated. But yeah, I mean, essentially the story is that modern humans evolved in Africa or somewhere near Africa. You know, it could have been North Africa or the Middle East, but somewhere in the kind of Afro Middle East region and expanded out of there in the last 60,000 years to populate the rest of the world. And, you know, that's the overarching story. And that honestly hasn't changed in 20 years. What has changed is the subtleties. So, you know, when I wrote my book, Journey of Man, and made that film two decades ago, 
Um, you know, I said we drove the Neanderthals to extinction and we didn't interbreed with them. Well, it turns out we actually did. So everyone in the world, it now turns out Africans as well, but particularly non-Africans, about 2% of our genomes comes from Neanderthals. So we interbred with Neanderthals and with these things called Denisovans, which are still, they're still somewhat elusive. We have a, a sense of where they probably mostly live. They were probably mostly living where I am now in Southeast Asia. Um, although there were pockets of them up as far as, you know, central Siberia. And they certainly have a larger population size than Neanderthals. So it turns out that, you know, Neanderthals were a chance discovery because most of the early paleoanthropologists happened to be European and they happened to be looking for things in Europe. But Neanderthals were probably a very tiny side branch of what was a much larger Denisovan population in East and Central Asia. Um, but we still don't know what a Denisovan looks like. Um, it probably looked a little like a Neanderthal. Probably, I would guess, you know, if we interbred with them, as the data suggests, two or three times, they probably absorbed some human DNA as well. So they probably look like a hybrid between Neanderthals and modern humans. Um, we're still figuring that out. But basically, the, the overall story is we emerged from Africa. You know, 98% of our genomes came out of Africa in the last 60,000 years. And we've expanded around the world, you know, in 2,000 human generations. We're much more closely related than we ever suspected before we started doing genetic studies. And so, you know, that's an amazing story. And that's, you know, as you say, that's what I've spent my career largely trying to track. I mean, my work in Central Asia, trying to figure out the genetic impact of Genghis Khan. And, you know, work I've done in Southeast Asia and the early settlements here and work I've done in North Africa and the Sahara region, um, you know, trying to figure out the paths of migration, how people made it out of Africa and how they migrated back over thousands of years. Um, yeah, I mean, that's mostly what I've spent my career doing. Uh, my friend, that sounds like another two beer conversation between you and I, because <laughs> we, we, could, we could continue on that for a couple more podcasts. Totally. Uh, speaking, speaking of two beer conversation though, I, two more questions for you. My first one is you actually could host the two beer conversation because you are co-owner of Antone's up in Austin, Texas. Uh, that was a place that I frequented all the time when I was a UT Longhorn, by the way. So thank you first and foremost. Uh, but I've got to ask while I have you here, do you have a favorite musician or a couple favorite concerts that you ever went to over your years as a rock and roller and blues fan? I mean, there's so many, there's so many amazing musicians. I mean, I was just thinking about this last night um, and there was a show that we had at Anton's. It was a closed door show um, that was only open to members of the, the nonprofit that we have, the Clifford Anton Foundation, which also, you know, sponsored Buddy Guy coming down and, and playing um, at one point, which we were talking about earlier. Um, but Lucas Nelson and Gary Clark Jr., dueling guitar solos up on the Anton stage. That was where I was like, dude, like everything, because it was not easy. It was not easy at all getting that thing up and running again. It, there, was, there was hair loss. There was <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears. No, there was a divorce. No, seriously, dude, like it was not trivial. Um, and that was where I was like, yeah, it, it was worth it. Um, and then, you know, a, a Robert Plant show that I saw at ACL Live in Austin. So, you know, the Austin City Limits Moody Theater, um, you know, just one of the most astounding performances I've ever seen any singer give. Like, his voice is still there. Like, those notes he hit when he was in Led Zeppelin, like, he can still do that. Plus, he's got like this kind of countryside now, which is awesome. Like, he's exploring roots music and everything else. No, I mean, listen, I, I'm constantly in awe of musicians and their talent. Um, you know, the, the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour thing is BS, in my opinion. 
Um, anybody can spend 10,000 hours learning to become decent or mediocre at something, but there's another situation with God-given talent and, you know, you, you, can't, you can't learn to do that. And, you know, Robert Plant singing is one of those things and Gary and Lucas playing guitar together is one of those things. I, I've played guitar for three decades nearly four decades now, I could never learn to do what they do on that instrument. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, I have a huge amount of respect for musicians, and that's, you know, as I said, a big part of the reason I, I wanted to preserve Antones. Well, definitely check out Antones if you are in the Austin area. It is a gym. It is a gym of downtown Austin, and I highly recommend it. Spencer, last question for you. Our, our audience is, is mostly individual investors here at, at Seven Investing, really an interest in where the future of healthcare is going, where, where genomics is going, kind of what progress this field is, is making. What are a couple of things that you would recommend that we take a look at to really figure out what's going on out there? What are, what are some sources or some things that you would recommend investors interested in this space be paying attention to? That's a really good question. Um, you know, obviously, like everybody's got their eye on CRISPR these days. It's so funny, CRISPR, I think most people in the investing community don't know where CRISPR came from. Um, CRISPR is a bacterial immune response. Like it's basically the immune system of a bacterium that was designed to fight off invasion by viruses. And you know, so much of our genome was designed to fight off infections from viruses. And, you know, it's really interesting evolutionarily. But, you know, CRISPR, this thing that was discovered in very basic biological studies at, at Jen Doudna's lab at, um, at Berkeley, you know, has, has become this huge entity. And like, you know, we, were, we mentioned earlier, you know, the CRISPR babies in China with Ho Jung Kui. Um, you know, that's, that's a big thing in the future. Um, to me, like, I, this is where I have to step back from what I know and what I've spent my career doing. I'm, I'm 51 now, and I got my start studying genetics back when it was still called genetics um, in 1985 when I started college. Um, DNA sequencing had just been invented by, you know, Sanger and Gilbert. They won the Nobel Prize for it a few years before I started college. And it, it has progressed so rapidly that, you know, it, it, I've said many times, like I've been so lucky to be able to practice my craft during this time in history. You know, it's, it's like getting in on the ground floor of the, like you look at the, the, the pace of change, the cost of DNA sequencing, genome sequencing, like that famous, like, NIH graph of, you know, it's essentially going from a gazillion dollars to zero, like in the space of like a decade, like that, that's never happened in human history. It's the most rapidly changing technology that's ever been created, much more so than Moore's law and, you know, the evolution of the transistor and the, the microchip. And so I've been incredibly lucky to be able to practice my craft during this time, but I have mostly used it to study existing variation and, you know, to study mostly human existing genetic variation, you know, to study how populations developed their historical patterns of genetic variants. I have never been particularly, you know, predisposed to wanting to change things at the genetic level because that's where I get a little bit antsy about the ethics and the potential ramifications on the biological side, because I think it's mostly engineers, people who come from like, particularly I would say a Silicon Valley, like software engineering background, who think if we just go in and tweak this one little thing, we can correct all of these other problems. You know, it's like fixing a website or it's like correcting the code for, you know, an app. 
And that works in engineering because humans created the entire system. We don't know that that works yet at the biological level. I'm very wary of things like what Ha Zheng Kui did in China. Um, I'm not saying they should never be done, you know, and maybe he'll prove me wrong, but I just feel like this is where, like, I have to, like, bow out at this point as a scientist. Like, that's not what I'm trained to do. It's not what I want to do. It kind of scares me. And at the same time, it is the future. The future is re-engineering human biology. And figuring out how to do that is up to the next generation of scientists. And it's gonna, it's gonna be scary. Like there's stuff that is hidden in our genomes that we don't completely understand. I mean, we know for instance, there are lots of dormant retroviruses that are buried in the human genome. Um, what happens if you like awaken one of those dormant retroviruses? I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm being alarmist, but you know, for me, that's not, that's not a forum I want to step into, but to me that it is the future of biology that's being explored right now. And that's where 20, 30, you know, possibly 40 year old people, scientists, you know, that's, that's what they should be focused on. And that's what investors should be focused on because, you know, the next trillion dollar company is not going to be an e-commerce company or a hardware company like Apple. Um, it's not going to be Amazon. It's, it's going to be, you know, a company that figures out how to harness the power of the human genome, like truly harness it and use it in an engineering sense. But it's, it's much harder than just building a buy now button. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Spencer, I, I've heard you say in the past that the 20th century was the century of physics and the 21st century is going to be the century of biology. Sounds fascinating and innovative, but lots of uncertainties like you mentioned there too. Yep. Well, lots to look forward to. Uh, once again, thank you to Spencer Wells, uh, the entrepreneur, geneticist, anthropologist, smart science dude, you know, all of the titles above. It's been really a pleasure. Thank you for calling in from Indonesia, spending the time with Seven Investing here this morning. Good talking to you. And Take thank care. You, and thank you everyone for tuning in. We really appreciate your time. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are Seven Investing.